But I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, and for those that are listening on the podcast, we've, we've, this week we'll probably reach around 14, uh, 1,400 people that have listened to our podcast, and it's interesting seeing the stats of where people are listening from, from uh, the east coast of the US, so thanks for all your groupies over there getting on board and listening to us. Uh, the UK, um, people in Queensland, uh, in New South Wales, and also in Victoria. And so if you're listening to us on podcast today, we also welcome you, but it's great to share with the the church family here today locally. Well, it was back in 1964 when a murder took place in New York City. It was one of 636 murders that actually took place um, that year. For approximately half an hour, Kitty Genovese... Uh, Genovis, uh, might be, yep, Genovis, uh, was attacked near her home. What remains to this day as a source of concern and continues to be studied was that the subsequent New York Times reported that at least 37 people in their apartments were aware of the attack taking place. But only two people called the police and only one person went to Kitty's aid. While the stabbing was horrific, the fact that so many did so little had the city ask a question about the lack of intervention that took place. Even today, even today in our own lives, in our own situations, we find similar situations, similar occasions where people, whether it be in workplace bullying or in sexual harassment cases, where the, there is a, either an intervention or a lack, and often a lack of intervention around these occasions. You know, there is a saying that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. But why do, why do good people do nothing? Why don't they find their voice to speak up, to challenge bad behaviour? Well, that answer is pretty easy, isn't it? We weren't there. Because if we were there, it'd be different, wouldn't it? We'd be, we'd speak up. We'd act. If we were there, we would have picked up the phone. We would have stopped to help. We would, we would have responded to the call. Or would we? Research published four years after Kitty's murder found that when people were in a group situation of four or more, that there was only a 31% chance of a response rate to that incident. That when there is one other person around, there is a 62% response rate. But when a response relies solely on you and you alone, research discovered that you are more likely to respond with 85% of participants responding to some form of intervention if they're the only one there at the time. And that happens for both men and women alike. Still convinced that you'd respond um, if there was a situation that you came across, even in a group setting? Perhaps you would. But let me ask you this. When someone is broken down on the side of the road and there's cars whizzing past, do you stop to offer assistance? A 2008 study by in the USA by a person um, known as Schillinger uh, found that a person's identification as a Christian actually didn't really make a difference at all to the response. This term used to describe the social behaviour is the diffusion of responsibility or bystander effect. There's a great video that I'll post up on our Facebook page about a smoke-filled room where a person by themselves in a smoke-filled room or a room that starts to have smoke come into it suddenly responds. They see something happening and they respond to that. But when there's a whole group of people and they're, all the others are um, there and they know that they're not to respond, this one person takes their cues from everyone else and even though the room fills with smoke, they still sit there and do nothing. Based on various social experiments, research shows that when we hear or see something that we don't like, if there are others around, we take our cues from them. 
We argue, well, if no one else is doing anything, then why should I? We justify our thinking. I don't know you. Why should I say something? Why should I do something? We wonder what others would think of us. After all, they're not doing anything. So we allow the problem to continue to go unaddressed. Someone's rude in a restaurant or perhaps bullying in a school ground or even a smoke-filled room. It's not that we don't care or that we agree with what's happening is okay, but we would wonder what others would think of us or that it's someone else's responsibility. So let's hold that thought just for a moment. Well, we're 85% of our way through Malachi. And last week, the whingers, not here, um, the whingers in Malachi and the complainers have been quite vocal. Denying God's love, showing contempt, applying pressure to get their own way, going against the covenant relationship that they had with God, questioning God's justice, cheating God out of his tithes and offerings, claiming that saying sorry to God is a waste of time and that serving God is pointless. For 85% of Malachi, these complainers have had their voice. And it's as if it's been the single voice of Malachi, the messenger of God, commissioned by God, to be his voice, to be God's voice, to challenge these complainers, calling people back to God. A lone voice calling people back to God in 430 BC and also in 2018 AD. Calling people to give God your best, to be true, to be faithful, to be just. And last week, to be generous. But then something small, something subtle happens. But then something that could easily be overlooked takes place in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Whereas for 85% of Malachi, God's messenger um, is challenging the complainers and the compromisers, the disobedient. But then in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, something well overdue, yet worth the wait, happens. Then those who feared the Lord spoke. From those who until now had remained silent, from those who till now had stood in the shadows, They now push through diffused responsibility. Then those who feared the Lord spoke. They finally found their voice. They stepped out of the shadows and stood up to be counted as God's, as God's children, fearing in a good way the Lord of heaven's armies more than they feared in a negative way, those who were busy voicing their opposition to God. They spoke. They didn't shout. They didn't argue. They spoke. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other. They turned to each other. They encouraged each other. And in doing so, they defied those who um, didn't fear God. It was as if they were saying, you don't speak for us anymore. We have our own voice. We will speak for ourselves. We will fear God and speak words to build each other up, not tear each other down. Those that loved the Lord spoke words of encouragement and the Lord listened to what they said. So let's look at some more of Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honour of his name. They will be my people says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who don't. In a situation when the dominant voice of the people has been for 
of those who want to criticise God and about who he is and what he is or isn't doing, there are those who do fear God, who love and treat God with honour and respect, and those who had previously been silent to each other and to the Lord of heaven's armies, they speak. And the Lord of heaven's armies turns his attention and listens to what they have to say. Now, if it wasn't, it's not as if God didn't listen to those who had been speaking uh, beforehand. They were, and God's, uh, God responded, challenging their words, the words of their mouth and the attitudes of their heart. But those who now speak, those who fear and love the Lord, God listens with attention and favour. So much favour that that when they speak, God takes note. It's as if he's in heaven and he says, hey, Gabriel, quick, get a scroll. Come on, these guys are speaking. I want to take a note of that. Oh, there's James there and there's Goliath and whatever their names are and, and he's writing all their names down. Wow. And he is excited about what they're saying. Now, it's obvious to me, and maybe to you too, that the Lord knows all, including the number of hairs on my head. And he remembers the covenant that he made with his people a millennia ago. But obviously, he is starting to fear that he's going to start to suffer from dementia because he needs to remember into the future who's speaking. So he can, at a later stage, look up. Now, who was that again? What was their name? I'm terrible with names. And so, obviously, God's struggling with this as well. And and so, you know, he wants to jot it down. Not likely. Malachi's declaration of the Lord's intention to note who spoke was to communicate to those who loved and feared the Lord that the Lord did notice. He was attentive. They were recognized and they will be remembered. So... So precious are those who love and fear the Lord that, that are prepared to speak words of encouragement that God wants to let them know through his prophet, your actions have been seen by me. I hear the words you speak, the courage that you bring and you bring out in others as well. And I, the Lord of heaven's armies, will remember you. You're important and precious to me because of what you have done. You love me and you want to honour my name and your decision to speak up has not gone unnoticed. But the Lord is not finished yet. Speaking words faithful to the covenant that he made with Abraham and his descendants. They will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day I will act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. The wicked have God's judgment coming. They have every reason to be afraid, to be very afraid of God's pending judgment. They stand against what God wants and try to influence others to do the same. What's the point? Why bother? According to the Lord, these people are wicked and disobedient. But to those who speak encouragement and hope to God's people, these people are different. God declares that they will be his people, his very own treasure. Because you fear me, the Lord of heaven's armies, and and because you speak these words of encouragement while others speak dissent, because you honour the covenant relationship with me, you are now and will continue to be for all of eternity to be my people, my special treasure. So in a world and a culture where those who would speak words of dissent against God, so in this world, Malachi called, Malachi's call is for followers of God, followers of Jesus, to be different, to fight against the diffusion of responsibility, to find a voice and to speak words of encouragement. And when you do, you will not go unnoticed by God. And in 2018, 
the call remains for us today as followers of Jesus to be different. God knows that we are social beings. God created us that way. But when we fear man more than we fear God, we lose our voice. We cave into the diffusion of responsibility. We allow those who speak against the things of God to be the dominant voice, whether it be at work, at home, with friends, at school or at uni, wherever it might be. We fall into the trap that no one else is saying anything and so I should keep quiet too. Even though they don't speak for me, I will keep my mouth shut. We fear that there's only one right thing to say or do and because I'm not sure of what it is, I'll say nothing, I'll do nothing. But God calls us to be defined, that squeaky, that croaky, that confused at times, but that small voice inside of us, to take a risk when that voice that is so loud and critical and the condescending voice or the negative voice is being heard, the voice that speaks against God. But your voice is to be different, not louder, not more authoritative or more eloquent. God calls you to be different and to have the voice of encouragement. God also calls us to be different in our character, to be people who have respect and reverence for who God is, to recognize that he is indeed the Lord of heaven's armies and with a word can bring life into existence, to be people who honor his name. This is more than coming to Northern to worship, but honoring God's name by making a conscious effort to live in such a way that when others look at us and the way we live and the choices that we make and the words that we use, they recognize that we live for King Jesus, to be different by being obedient, not to earn God's love, but because God loves us and died on the cross to take away our sin and our guilt, that we respond out of love and seek to live in a way that is obedient and consistent with the values of the kingdom of God, to be different by living righteous lives, right relationship with God lives, to live in a right relationship with God by confessing our sins, by responding to God's call, by allowing God's Holy Spirit to be at work in us, pruning and refining and empowering us to be the best that we can be, to be different by serving God. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, no one can serve two masters for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. There are plenty of people who look for possessions to bring them security And the economy of the West is built on this consumerism. But God calls us to serve Him. The word serve also means to worship. Worship is more than what we do on Sunday. It's the way we serve God every single day. Once again, God's call through the prophet Malachi in Malachi's day remains God's call to us today. To be people who are different to be people of good character, to be people who find our voice and be prepared to speak up and to speak out words of encouragement. You know, you would be hard-pressed to find communication in the New Testament that encourages the followers of Jesus to just go with the crowd, to go with the flow. To be a follower of Jesus is to be different, but to be different for all the right reasons. Peter, one of Jesus' first followers, writes as we read earlier today uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 to 19. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about the Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, They'll be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. We believe that God calls us to make a difference in the world. But you know what? It is really hard to make a difference in the world if we're not prepared to live lives that are different. 
The assumption that Peter makes here is that we will be different for all the right reasons. And living a life that is different will prompt people to ask questions of us. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. You know, I've been in Melbourne for 18 months and in that time I have talked to a number of people about being a follower of Jesus. And in those 18 months, there has only been one occasion where I've copped any flack for that. You know, so often we can just live in fear that if I do say something, what are other people going to think of me? And because we live in fear, it's almost like a confirmatory bias that, that we have this, oh, well, because I don't say anything, I won't say anything. And because I, I'm scared of what other people might say. And, and so it just all kind of caves in on us and, and builds up this darkness around us. But if we step out in faith rather than living with fear, then I believe you'll be surprised at the reception you'll receive. God calls us to be different, to live differently and to speak differently. When others speak against God and what he's doing, will you rise to the character call? Will you find your voice? Will you be different? We've got an opportunity to respond to the things that God might be saying to you today, whether it be through Matt's leading of communion, whether it be through one of the songs, whether it be through this message time. But there's a couple of questions that we've got on the screen that you can read through. And to wrap around that, In what situations is God calling me to have a voice? To push through that diffused responsibility, to rise to the call of being a voice and make a difference. Who can I encourage this week to be different and to make a difference in their lives? And where can I be different in my character? Not to live in fear. Maybe it's in the way I show respect to others, show reverence, honour, obedience, in some of my life choices in my service, my worship, the list goes on from there. But my encouragement is, as the music's played for the next few minutes, that you take some time to reflect and to respond to the things that God is saying to you today. God bless you.